Dr. Thomas Bouchard and Dr. Ted Fenske team up together for this presentation on relating to the LGBTQ community. Dr. Thomas Bouchard is a family physician based out of Calgary and has been actively involved in conscience rights issues for those in Alberta. Dr. Ted Fenske is a cardiologist. He's also a clinical professor in the Department of Cardiology at the University of Alberta. Fenske has been reaching out and working with the LGBTQ community since his days of practicing medicine in Vancouver's downtown east side. Dr. Bouchard and Dr. Fenske take a pastoral approach in how they care for the LGBTQ community, holding grace and truth hand in hand in their practice of medicine. Thank you for being here and showing your interest in this uh, topic. I was just telling Thomas uh, that this has been a, a very important topic for me for a long time, uh, and I'll tell you the details of that, but uh, it's been very difficult to engage uh, Christian doctors in this, and, and nobody wants to touch it, it seems. It's a, it's a very, very, very hot button issue, and so you know, one thing to do, is, as Larry was talking about yesterday, is just be really afraid and, and not get involved. And, and I, I, I'm, we're hoping that by the end of this, you'll at least uh, feel some of this passion that we have, and you at least want to be involved on some level. And there's different, level, different ways that we can be involved uh, on this very, very important uh, topical topic. And if we're not going to speak to this topic, then really what is our role as, as Christians in, in the healthcare? What, what really is our role, particular role? If it's just going to practice medicine, just this or that, if we can't speak to the, the hard issues, then I think we have to question our faith and what it's all about. So I think, I, I think we have to be able to speak to every particular issue, and this one included, even though it's a, a tough one. And in terms of our, our objectives, there's three that we want to focus on. Firstly, uh, Tom is going to review with us uh, something of the biblical se sexual ethic and its defense. We're going to look at kind of the, the foundation, if you like, the framework of, of the discussion. And then secondly, what I like to do is address our professional and pastoral uh, response. I put those together because I, my, my thesis is that we have this priestly calling, you know, that uh, Dr. Noello talked about yesterday afternoon. We have this priestly calling in medicine. And so uh, it's not just me prescribing antihypertensives, it's me thinking of the whole person, and, and, and in particular in this kind of scenario. And so uh, addressing our response then to these people struggling in sexual confusion. And then for the bulk of our time together, we're hoping to have a, a, a forum for reflection and equipping where we can have Q&A and you can tell us what you think because it, by no means are we experts in this area. We're just really passionate about it and we, we'd like to be involved on some level and, and, and you can tell us you know, what, what, how we should proceed. So uh, with that, with that as, as, the, as the beginning point, I'll... Uh, hand it over to Thomas Bouchard here. Great, so, <clears throat> um, and I by no means have, am an expert either. Ted has way more experience than I do in this area. And I think when the organizing committee were looking for a Catholic and a Protestant, I was the scapegoat. So I get to <laughs> share a bit of the Catholic perspective, but uh, I, just as an introduction, I, I really want to thank all of you for being present. And, and the fact that we can get our organizations together. I was very happy to do that in Calgary, and now that we're doing that again in Halifax, it's just, it warms my heart to be all in the same room, under the same roof, and to be able to share ideas together. I think it's so important. So um, th thank, I, I thank the organizing committee for, for wanting to put Ted and I together to share different perspectives. And uh, e even if, you know, we, we have different approaches in general, I think we agree on most things, and in particular on this issue, I think it's uh, something that we can uh, share on and, and come together to, to help heal the culture. So uh, I'm not going to go too deep into the biblical sexual ethic, but that, that is our foundation, so we want to talk about that. Um, you know, going back to uh, Genesis, you know, God making us in his own image and creating us as male and female, you know, so having this idea of the image of God is implanted in us as male and female. And we could see that in our bodies, you know. And if you look in the mirror in the morning, you can see there's something, and Adam would have seen this too. He would have been thinking, well, what, what is this all for? You know, there's got to be some purpose to this, right? And you only discover the purpose of what we look like as, as kind of naked without shame when you see the other, which is um, man for a woman and woman for a man, right? Like the... There is, there is uh, something we can discover in, the, um, in what we see in our bodies, right? 
And uh, there's a beautiful reflection in a series of Wednesday audiences from St. John Paul II, who uh, uh, spoke about something called the theology of the body. And the way he framed this um, from, uh, from Genesis is talking about our bodies having languages. And we speak the language of our body when we uh, bear the truth in our body and about our body. And so we can discover a lot of things. And um, he, was, he, he kind of followed a domain of philosophy called phenomenology, where you can um, kind of discover insights about our nature and about ourselves through observation, reflecting on ourselves, reflecting on our experiences. And that's where this theology of the body comes from. And just uh, being icons of God, that as male and female, we are mirrors of God, right? Like there is something about us that um, reflects uh, the mind of God. So, and, and there is in this biblical sexual ethic, the idea that we are uh, a, a complementary unit as male and female. The other thing I want to talk about is um, this expression here, words of the house of be being, comes from Heidegger. And uh, Peter Kreef says that what you do to words, you do to being. And so the narrative that uh, plays out in our culture and that we speak with our, our lives and with our words um, actually changes the way we view being, right? So, um, and this, uh, the reason I bring up Jordan Peterson is because uh, he has been, uh, the reason why he's so popular is because of words, right? He, he specifically uh, gained popularity when, with Bill C-16, he refused to uh, use pronouns that were coerced by the government to be used, right? And um, I'll just read you this quote. Identity is not and will never be something that people define subjectively because your identity is actually something that you have to act out in the world as a set of procedural tools, which most people learn between the ages of two and four. And so what, what he's getting that at with regards to our own identity is that um, it's something that we're using to kind of explore the world and to kind of identify ourselves. And there are problems when we uh, kind of start to self-identify, say in a sexual way, in ways that don't reflect who we are and who God made us to be. And this is now, with regards to the pronouns, it's now playing out in um, whether we use uh, pronouns in a certain way in our consult letters, for example. Um, and a colleague of mine uh, in CMDS, Joe Askin, many of you know him, we've talked about in the last year, well, what do we do if we, there are forced pronouns uh, when we write a consult letter? And I don't think it will necessarily come up in dialogue because we usually use a person's name, right? We don't usually use a third person in our office interactions. But if I were writing a consult to a cardiologist, for example, um, the, the question is, would I use a pronoun that somebody prefers uh, uh, to, to address them, or would I do something differently? And we can have a discussion about that a little bit later. Um, and then the other thing, too, relates to uh, how this is changing in terms of how the government documents are, are, are being used. For example, in the new uh, Alberta prenatal record, uh, they actually, it's in draft form right now, but they're actually looking at a little gender pronoun box. You have to fill in their gender pronoun. I mean, these are women in obstetrics who are, you know, like th the fact that we need to write a gender pronoun on, on the Alberta prenatal record is, is uh, a bit crazy. In preparing for this talk, I read a really fascinating book that I encourage you guys to read, and it's called Why I Don't Call Myself Gay. And this young man, Daniel Matson, uh, has same-sex attraction. And one of the things that uh, he was frustrated with was the labeling, right? He never liked the idea of calling himself gay. And since writing this book, he's had a lot of young men write to him and say, I, I don't call myself gay, but I do struggle with kind of same-sex attraction or confusion or things like this. And what I like about uh, Dan Matson's approach is that he's he's really um, stripping uh, um, the the labels from um, the identity, right? And and trying not to box people in. So this quote from the book kind of captures that. Fundamental to the aims and goals of the gay rights movement was convincing society that homosexuality is 
as inherent and essential an aspect of his nature as his skin color and ethnicity. The reframing of sexuality from behavior to identity has brought about a lot of confusion in the world, especially among young people. You know, in, in the confusion um, at the time of, of puberty and, and sexual exploration, um, because there's a, th this idea that the, the gay movement really pushed forward that you have to identify in a certain way, um, rather than it being a behavior, it, may, it, it makes that confusion even worse because young people think, well, if, if this is, a, you know, I, I, have, I had some kind of reaction to this friend of mine, maybe I'm gay, right? And, and not, it's not a sense of uh, exploring a behavior. It's almost like I have to take on an identity psychologically because of, of some kind of thing that happened to me in, a, in what can be a confusing time. Um, there's another interesting article that I read by a guy named Anthony Eastland. He's an academic in the States who talked about the importance of the puberty transition for a boy uh, specifically. And his view is that a father and a son have to navigate puberty together. That we, we can't just let our children navigate puberty um, on their own and just left to the confusion that can happen, the sexual confusion that can happen through the changes of puberty. And what he's suggesting is a parent and a child need to work through that together rather than uh, just letting things happen and maybe having one birds and the bees talk when they're, pu when they're going through puberty, right? And that it is, it, it's kind of this team-based approach to get through puberty together and to work on it together and to say, what are you struggling with? That also requires that we have friendship with our children to be able to say, you know, I, I want you to tell me things that are, you're struggling with. They, they have to trust us in a way that, uh, that they're able to bring up these things with us rather than with friends. Um, so navigating uh, puberty is not something we just leave to our children, but allow them to, uh, to na we, we navigate it with them. Bringing this to uh, clinical practice, I think it's important to uh, avoid labels in general too. When somebody comes up to you and, and uh says that maybe they're gay or they're lesbian um, and, and you know how you handle that you, you should think about what you're how you're going to react to them I remember the first time uh, one of my lesbian patients said uh, because she knew I was Catholic she said uh, Dr. Bouchard did you know I was lesbian I said no I didn't and she said uh, well do you have anything to say about that I said well is there anything you want to talk to me about, about, uh, about this? And she's like, no. I said, okay, that's fine. And it's this sense of uh, <laughs> not, not that, like, it, it, it actually may not be relevant to the visit of the day, right? If it were relevant, yeah, we can explore it. If she wanted to explore it, we could explore it. But she was expecting judgment, right? She was expecting me to say, um, you know, I... I uh, I disagree with your lifestyle. I, I don't know what she was expecting. S some kind of, of, of judgment on, on her state of being, right? But I think, and Ted will emphasize this too, but the idea that do we have a welcoming space for people to come to and be able to, to, to work out their life in a way that is just um, a person to another person, you know, not a person to a label or a person to some kind of... Um, um, kind of set of, of um, you know, ideas that are played out because of that label, right? Um, and, and on this topic, we, you know, talking about behavior, identity, navigating puberty, uh, I think there's also an important area to um, allow people to, um, you know, come to us from all walks of life. So I, I have some priest friends who refer to me for various things, and one referral was, um, you know, it, it's kind of funny because sometimes as, as physicians we're a bit like priests in the sense of uh, we receive people's confessions, right? And uh, priests are a lot like doctors because they, they see people's open wounds, right, and, and dress them in a spiritual way. So, uh, so I have a few priest friends who we refer back and forth, you know, so... This pr one young man who went to confession, the priest said, you need a doctor. He came to the doctor, and sometimes I tell him, you need confession, right? <laughs> so, uh, and, and when we're talking about a spiritual inventory, about what people need, um, for, for my Catholic patients, I don't hesitate to say, 
um, when I have a good rapport with them, it really depends on your rapport and, and having that level of comfort. But sometimes I say, have you been to confession recently? And in particular for this guy who was referred by a priest, I knew that was part of his paradigm, right? So I ask him as part of my visit with him, when was the last time you went to confession, right? So, uh, but I don't do that with everybody, not to worry. Um, so uh, so th this young man came to me with um, a lot of sexual wounds from his past and has a sexual addiction to older men, partly because of his wounds from the past, and has a severe pornography addiction. Now, this priest referred him to me because of his worry, and he, I'm a family doctor with no experience in sexual medicine. But uh, the reason I bring this up is because um, as a family doctor, I have an open heart, an open generalist heart, which means I take any and all comers, right? <laughs> and my wife sometimes asks me, like, how did, you, how did that come up, right? Because, it's, you know, I had a, a little boy who was struggling with his young brother and they, were, they had a lot of conflicts related to Lego. So we had a little bit of a Le Lego therapy session. She's like, Lego? Why do you talk about Lego? All this to say that in family medicine, we talk about anything and everything, right? <laughs> and so when this young man came to me with this severe sexual addiction and uh, severe pornography addiction, I had to do some reading about it. But what I was doing mostly was listening to him, right? And listening to his wounds. And, and I've been seeing him now for two years. And we see on, on different occasions. And we see, he sees me through ups and downs, right? Like I, I just tell him, give me the updates, right? And he'll tell me about, sometimes it's bad, right? Sometimes he's had lots of encounters and sometimes he has no encounters, right? And it, it's really kind of opened my heart to be able to say, how can I help you better, right? And, and I'm the only one who talks to, to about this, right? And so what I'm getting at with that story is we have to be able to be these welcoming places in our office and be open to hearing these stories and hearing these wounds. And sometimes... It's actually just um, our patients showing us their wounds. We actually don't always have solutions for them. And sometimes we're just looking at their wounds with them and saying, um, you know, how about a little bit of salt? Or some, like it's very, sometimes it's very small things that we do, but maybe we're the only person that they can share these, their wounds with, right? Um, and on that topic, in regards to pornography, there, I, although I don't have the websites here, there are several good websites to help with pornography addiction, and it's very, um, it, it is hugely prevalent in our society, and it feeds into a lot of sexual addictions as well. And so, just as a, as a sidebar, um, considering whether you bring up addiction to pornography, because it's far more common than alcoholism and smoking, right? So, if you look at the numbers, it is, it is incredible the amount of people, it, it, like 80% of people, Christian and non-Christian, are using pornography on a regular basis, like monthly. And then it goes a little bit lower um, for, for more regular use. But, but the, the, if you look at the actual statistics for, for porn addiction, it is, it is astounding. So I regularly ask, particularly young, young men, but it's becoming more common in women as well. So addressing the pornography addiction is one of the things that has to be unpacked when people come to you with some of these sexual wounds. Now, um, the, the last thing I'm going to leave you with is um, uh, a good Protestant, Sir William Osler, who um, was, uh, was, was, a, was a great humanist, who, who cared about the person, who cared about not just the disease. And you know, the, you've heard probably many quotes by Osler like, um, it is much more important to know what sort of a patient has a disease and what sort of disease has a patient. And uh, the idea that, that Osler really brought and that, that, is, that has been forgotten with the biopsychosocial model is that we cannot be reductionists with our patients. We really have to see them as persons with, um, that are going to bring any story to us and that we have to be ready for any of those stories. And, and to, to see them as a person, not as a label. And... Um, that sometimes we have to address some of these difficult issues like, uh, like gender and sexual issues with them, um, even when they're not ready to hear certain things, right? And so we have to do it in a sensitive way, and, but, but at the same time, trying to avoid the labels, trying to avoid things that will, will um, set them off or think that we're judging them so that they feel free to tell their story. But we still have to deal with the, the objective, right? So 
for example, I use, you, I use one example of saying like, if somebody is um, kind of dressing or looking like a woman, yet has a prostate, we still have to screen them for prostate cancer, right? So there has to be this objectivity, even though people might be identifying with, uh, you know, a, a gender that doesn't reflect their biology, we have to still think about their biology, right? And so the way we do that and the finesse and the gentleness with which we approach those things will allow people to come and see us no matter what our perspective is. And then and that, you know, especially in family medicine, I think it's easy to say we're in this for the long game, right? This is not kind of a, a one visit shot where we're um, kind of have to unpack everything all at once, but that when we're there for a lifetime, we can say, you know, I'm not getting, I'm, we're, we're, we're b making baby steps, right? We're not getting there all at once. So those are a few thoughts. And, and mainly my part, because I'm not the expert here, is to really just give you food for thought, because I really want to get some good discussion going, and Ted and I are happy to kind of give other reflections based on your comments. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Excellent. Uh, really wise words. Uh, and and I, I've got three boys I have to send to you for Lego therapy. Uh, <laughs> I saw a cartoon, uh, a fellow who's just being welcomed into hell, and there's the demon there with his pitchfork, and, and he's saying to the fellow, oh yeah, no, we got rid of coals long ago, we've replaced with Lego. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my memory, just getting to the living room, you know, at the, anyway. Um, you may be asking yourself, you know, why on earth would a cardiologist be giving a talk on, on LGBT uh, health? Uh, and um, you know, I've been asking myself that question too. But the, um, I'm really pleased that you uh, brought up pornography. I, I wasn't going to uh, in this talk, but uh, there's a tendency to think of the non-heterosexual, the, the lesbian, the gay, the LGBT, as a, a separate area, like, like this is a separate sin. That's really bad. You know, all the stuff that we do, that's, that's you know, just misdemeanor or whatever. But this is, this is really bad. We have to do something about that, you know? But I would say, no, the whole thing, everything, all of it, all, all your ramifications of sexual sin, all of it together. I, I'm not saying these are not gradations, bestiality, pedophilia, or whatever, but I'm saying it's all sin, you know? And so, in a, in a sense, in that sense, then, uh, none of us are really straight. You know, there, there's a, uh, uh, we're all bent on a certain level, and we're, we've all gone astray on a certain level. I think that's very important when we're having this kind of a discussion, that it's not this kind of, you know, I'm, I'm perfect, it's their problem. No, no, this is the human condition. This is, this is a problem that we have. We're in this fallen world. This is tough. And, and I was brought into this to answer the question in terms of why a cardiologist would do a talk like this. Uh, this is my introduction to medicine. So I, I was the mid-80s, very much like Loris's story uh, in terms of uh, uh, his beginnings of uh, internal medicine uh, practice. It was the mid-80s for me. I was, in, I was in Vancouver, St. Paul's Hospital, right in kind of the center of the gay district. And I was a medical student, and my first patients were these guys. And they, they were my age at the time. And they, they all had you know, these opportunistic infections, these really weird cancers, Kaposi sarcoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, in, in unusual places. And we had just like, you know, very ineffective therapies for them. It was pre-antiretroviral, so there's nothing that I could do to help them. And so, you know, and they were in there, they were in there for their, their long haul. They were in there for their, you know, weeks before they all died. Every single one of my patients died. That, that, that's my story. So it was, it was brutal, absolutely brutal for me. And I, but the thing is, you, you get to know them. You get to know their families, their friends, their, their lovers, their, their, their whole support system. Uh, and you're, you walk through that. And what made it harder for me was that at the time, uh, medical students had to pronounce death. That was our job. It changed over time when I became an intern then interns had to pronounce death. <laughs> and then when I was a resident in internal medicine, well, that's the resident's job. And I was, I was shocked that in 97, when I got my first staff position at the, at the Alex downtown Edmonton, it's the staff job to pronounce death. <laughs> like, what is this? I'm the angel of death. I mean, I am, you know? <laughs> so anyway, I've seen a lot of death. But uh, this is a brutal boot camp in, in terms of medicine. Ozer, uh, he's one of my heroes, not just because he's a good Protestant, but, but uh, he said a lot of good things, good doc. But uh, he said, no syphilis, uh, no medicine. And I would have said, in this time, uh, no AIDS, and you know the limitations of medicine. 
and, and you know, suffering. So uh, it was a formative time. <laughs> and it, it beat me up. And so I, my heart just goes out to these people because I, I know something of that, that struggle, you know, and, and heard their stories, uh, heard their abuses that they had on them. And, and it's not all victimization, but there was a lot of victimization going on. It, it was a terrible time. And so how do you respond? Well, I, I'm not going to you know, give up the, the claims of the Bible, not at all. I, that, that's what I'm saying. That's where I'm coming from. This is where my concern comes from. It comes out of the biblical perspective. And so we have these exclusive claims of Christ. And I, I don't want us to, to give up that one iota. But at the same time, uh, if we don't reach out in care and compassion of these people, then, then what on earth is, is it good to have the Bible? I mean, we, we need to be able to <coughs> share that, that good news and lean on it, lean on the gospel message so that we can bring something to these people who are in such, such pain. It's not about their sexuality anyway. It's about their holiness. It's about our holiness. And so this is, this is the sense. It's this balance then we have to be able to strike. It's this tension. And I like this image of the bow because that's, that's me. That's you, under tension. And that's when we're most effective. When that bow is under tension, then, you know, then it's deadly. When it's just by itself with no string on it, it's a weird stick. And, uh, <laughs> and so we're called to be in that uncomfortable tension of, of this. And so this is the, the reality of, of medical practice, where we find ourselves. There's different ways of responding to the, the LGBT. I, and I would say it's very, very important that we understand you know, where we're, where we're talking. So there's the public sphere, and I've had a taste of that. That's a different area. And we use different language, and we've got to be really careful there. It's a very, very dangerous area to be in. But uh, that, that's, there's a certain way of responding. I think we need to be able to have a certain way, way of standing in, in the public square and just speaking winsomely on this topic. Um, but uh, what I wanted to focus on here was more of our... Uh, professional, pastoral perspective with individual people who are struggling in this, in this way. And we're going to focus on two elements. Uh, one is the health disparity element, and the second is the identity crisis element. And those are, I think, the two key issues that I'd like you to take away from my, my pr uh, presentation here. So that there is a, because of the um, discrimination and stigmatiz stigmatization that's happened in this community, they've been less wanting to, to be under medical scrutiny. They've, they're slow to come to medicine. They have been historically so. And, and they do have a higher prevalence of disease. I'm not making that up. It's, it's, in, it's in the literature, LGBT medicine. That's why I use the LGBT. This is our, 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 our uh, PubMed um, our, the, uh, uh, moniker for this uh, whole area of literature, which the, it's vastly growing. Um, and they, they have a higher prevalence of diseases. And then when you, when you bring together a delay in medical care and higher prevalence of disease, you have a health disparity. And, that, and that's what we still have, even though there's been tremendous inroads in what's happened here with this population from the mid-'80s when we, when we were struggling with antibiotics for, for AIDS. Um, there's still a, a lot of issues that are going on here. And, and the, the health disparity is something that we can stand in, we can stand in this gap as physicians, nurses, healthcare providers. We can get in there and, and certainly not allow this to, 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 to carry on. Um, they have higher rates of um, depression, anxiety, suicide, remarkable suicide rates. And this is uh, particularly when they go down the pathway of hormonal therapy, uh, when they have uh, s sexual uh, uh, surgeries on their bodies for, for uh, reassignment surgeries. Their suicide risks even go up higher in that group. It's not like this is a solution for their, their deep-seated uh, troubles. Higher alcohol, drugs, smoking. So I see a lot of, a lot of my patients uh, in, the, in that area. Smoking cessation is one of my things. And uh, the traumatic stress disorder, uh, eating disorders, HIV, uh, sexually transmitted disease, cancers. Uh, they're not being screened for cancers often. And, and the list goes on. Homelessness, prostitution intimate violence, sexual abuse. It's a high-risk group. And, and uh, you know, Jesus said, hey, it's, it's not the health that need the doctor, you know? These people need the doctor. They need to have us involved in, in their care on some level. Uh, and I, I would just use this analogy. Maybe it's a bit of a trite one, but um, 
I, I, I spent a lot of time on, on the smoke and cessation front, and so I said, look, you know, the, when I'm dealing with smokers, you know, I love smokers, and, and because I'm worried about them. Uh, they, they're high cardiovascular risk, and so these are my peeps. These are the people I want to have in my clinic, you know? And so, but I don't start with, you gotta quit smoking, you know? I don't start with, that's on my, you know, my opening line. I, I, I develop a relationship with these people, and the, the issue at hand is really the, the, the advertising campaigns, the tobacco companies, this, this is the enemy for us, not the darn person who's struggling with the nicotine addiction. And likewise, uh, the people in the LGBT health community uh, are, are not our enemies. They're our patients, or they're our peeps as well, and we have to reach out to them. Uh, they're at high risks for, for suicide, high risk for, for um, violence, high risk for, for cancers, not being screened, high risk for loneliness, and, 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 uh, and it's tragic. And so we need to be uh, having a, a, a welcoming environment of some sort. And so I found quite useful. I was at a uh, internal medicine uh, conference uh, in the States, and I uh, made a point of going to the LGBT lectures, uh, which I found difficult, because there's just such an overlay of agenda and worldview there. But um, this, this textbook just came out. It's still kind of warm when I, when I bought it. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, uh, but it, it details, it's a bit thick, not quite enough pictures for my liking, but, but it details the, you know, the, the issues at hand uh, you know, from a certain perspective. It's still very useful for me to, to, to glean uh, understanding of, of, of this uh, patient group and what they're experiencing, what they're going through, and maybe certain ways of how, how we can be involved without compromising anything. So having a welcoming clinical environment, for example, uh, we talked about uh, the, the names a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I'm very happy to use their preferred name, anyone's preferred name. Usually I, I, I address my patients by Mr. or Mrs. or Ms., usually Ms. or Mr. Uh, out of, uh, and when I have my medical students, I'm trying to show how, how, I, how I talk with them in terms of a professional ethic and, and showing them respect and dignity. You know, they're little old ladies in, in a bed with diapers. I still call them, you know, Ms. so-and-so because I'm trying to maintain that, that level of dignity. But, uh, you know, if I have a patient in the LGBT community and he wants to be called Nancy, Nancy, this is very easy for me to do. No problem at all. And I know how, how important it is to have a name. I, my name's Ted Theodore, and, uh, but in German it's Theodore. And for, for short, it's Theo. And try in the 60s to be called Theo on the playground. <laughs> it was tough. It was tough, you know. Like the boy named Sue, you know, Johnny, Johnny Cash. But anyway, so I did not like that name, and uh, I got beaten up over it, and really I didn't like to be kind of lumped in with that kind of a uh, name. So I said to my parents, hey, you know, my, you know my, I'd like to go with Ted. Because after all, it's Theodore and Ted. We're in Canada, come on. Get off the German. And so, uh, <laughs> so they, they conceded, and I, I got the Ted going. And it was amazing how I remember going to school in grade 10, um, Anyway, I had to sign up for, for uh, it was September, I signed up for class, you know, and the, the, it was a new school for me, and I went up to the office, and, and they said, name? I said, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. No, they took it, you know? Like, they believed me. It was such a feeling, like, oh, I, I'm, I'm this kind of acceptance, this is the new me, and I could just kind of relax into it. So anyway, it's, it's different. I, I understand it's different, but, but I understand the name thing is so important. If it's just a name we're talking about, that's going to make the difference between this patient you know, being relaxed and, and trusting me as a physician. Oh my gosh, this is easy. So, and and I, I, I agree that the pronoun thing is difficult, and when I dictate, I dictate Nancy, the patient, Nancy, the patient, that's how I do it. So I want to be clear to the, to the doctor, uh, this is male to female, uh, uh, transgender, so we're clear, because we, we, we have to be clear in medicine about what we're talking about. We can't get all jumbled up. You know, like in neurology, you gotta know right and left. You don't want to mix that stuff up, you know? Because there's all these, like, it's tough. It's, and so you gotta be clear about that, and we have to be clear about our gender. You know, as Thomas said, you know, if you've got a prostate, I, I have to know you've got a prostate. I have to know you've got a uterus. We have to know these things, you know, for uh, surveillance and, and the like, and, and heart disease or, or what have you. So, so we do have to be clear about things, and I don't want to get lulled into that. But what I'll say is this, in my, in my dictation, this uh, male to female transgender patient who goes by the name of, in quotations, Nancy, 
bang, under my, under my letter, and then I just go back to Nancy in the letters. And it's clear as crystal when you read the thing, and it's clear for me a year later when I, when I read the, my own letter, and I remember they like to be called that name, or they like the pronoun zur, or whatever it is. I put that in there too, because it's good heads up. You know, so if you, if you have a patient who wants to be called zur, pronoun, just let me know that, and then I can you know, slip it in once in a while, and it, it really helps to build uh, this, this relationship and connect. Uh, the single stall gender, gender neutral washroom. This is a no brainer, and we have this in our clinic. It's so easy. And so in, in, in Europe, you know, we've got family in Germany, and, and uh, you know, we go for a swim. Uh, the boys want to go for a swim, so we all go into this large change room, this giant change room to go for a swim in the, in the, the bod. And uh, everyone's just getting naked, like male, female, everyone. Like we're all just, it's Europe, you know, just relax, you guys. <laughs> and so anyway, we're a bit, we're a bit uh, you know, uh, we got some work to do here in North America, but just to relax about this thing. But anyway, they, they do need some privacy. Uh, and ask them about any special needs chaperone. I involve chaperones a lot. Lots of sexual abuse stuff happening here. So I, I have my, my uh, technicians in the clinic area. They come and join me. This is very routine. I, I do it for younger women anyway. I just don't want to be in the room with young women. I just, I, for, for my own protection, you know? I mean, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a magnet for these people. I'm just, <laughs> Just kidding. My, my wife's here, so I just said that for <laughs> And so, and, and being, a, you know, having a, a thoughtful, thoughtful history. These are very easy things to do. And they might kind of grind us on a certain level, you know, like we're kind of caving or whatever. But uh, believe me, I, there, there's lots of mileage to be gained here. These are simple little steps that we can take that make a giant, giant difference for, for patients who are so struggling uh, in, in this area. And then the second issue is the, the identity. And this is, a, this is a broad topic in medicine. So I deal with it almost all the time. Almost every single patient that, that I see on, on my ward has a certain identity crisis uh, because I've induced it. They've come in, I've put a, I put a, uh, a gown on them, I can see their backside, and they're, and they're, they're, they're a patient. They've got a, 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 a new identity now, uh, left main disease, or you know, dissected carotid, or whatever it is. And, or the hip in room seven. I hate when I hear that kind of thing. But anyway, we reduce people down to disease. They have this, this identity issue they're having to deal with. They were a banker. They were doing, doing it all one day, and now they're on the cardiology CCU, and, and they've lost it all. You know, and they're being told they can't go back to that or whatever. This is a, a tra traumatizing time to be a patient. And so I deal with identity all the time. And so these people have to be reassured that they have value beyond that disease label, and, and we have to be able to speak truth into who they really are in terms of their significance, in terms of their acceptance, in terms of their security. We can easily, so easily do this hand on the shoulder, human touch, the therapeutic touch. This is an incredible opportunity for us in medicine to be able to easily just put your hand on someone's shoulder and say, you know, you're going to be okay here, you know. Good to see you today. Sit down on the bedside, hold their hand just for a moment. They, they need to be touched. And the LGBT community also need to be touched in appropriate ways with, with hand holding, hand on the shoulder, and it's such a response you get from these people. It's, it's beautiful. And it'll, it'll go a long, long ways. And so I've done different things. I encourage people to, um, you know, bring in photos. Uh, I, I encourage uh, a whole variety of things. These are just two examples. This is not LGBT. This is just general patients. Uh, you know, one person took it a bit far, and she had her whole class, you know, do, do drawings for her, and they redecorated the entire uh, room with her artwork. Uh, another patient of mine, uh, I, he was a really grumpy guy waiting for bypass surgery. The nurses warned me about him, and when I was talking to him, uh, he, uh, he said that he played in a, in a worship band, and I, I do too, and I happen to have my guitar in my car, so I left rounds, got my guitar, brought it back, and he played this Johnny Cash gospel tunes while we did rounds. It was beautiful. <laughs> Now, this identity crisis that our patients experience on a regular basis, this is, this is ramped up remarkably in, in the LGBT uh, community. So we're dealing with uh, not, not two genders anymore, of course. If we, if we, we're dealing with 50 plus genders. Uh, now, that, that, and the, the confusion is, it's hard to even keep, keep track of, of it all when one reads the literature. But the, the WHO, uh, uh, defines gender then as a social construct. That, that is the, the official definition of, social, of, of gender now, is that we construct it and, and there's over 50 different options to choose from. Uh, underneath this stuff is, is unmet need. It's very similar to the euthanasia argument. You know, I, I want to die. Well, just scratch through that. Just like, why do you want to die? Like, you know, maybe not that exact question, but when you scratch through that, you realize there's all this other stuff going on there and here too. So there's a, a giant, uh, 
well of pain here. And the thing is, as Christian practitioners, we can speak to this. We have vocabulary. We, we can, our, 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 our atheist colleagues, they don't know what to say here, you know? And, and they have very impoverished uh, perspectives, but we can actually speak to it. But we're not the only ones speaking, and we, weren't, we were maybe a bit slow to speak. And so uh, the culture speaks, and the LGBT movement, if you like, this whole movement then is out there, and they are speaking, and they are providing identity for these people. They're providing community. They're providing meaning-making for them. They're op giving opportunities val to validate an experience, and affirm a longing, to be unique, to be special. We want this. I want this for myself, they do too. And this community will give them that, and so it's been developed uh, quite uh, uh, remarkably in what I would refer to as the gay script. And so, and this, it goes this way, there's three points to it. The same sex attraction that you feel, this is natural, this is normal, this is even good. Secondly, the, the feelings that you, that you feel, that's you. You know, that feeling you got, that's your core you, that's who you really are. And the last one, if you want to fulfill that, then you have to have sexual fulfillment. It's the behavior is the way to fulfill that. And there's two sins in our current culture, judging and not fulfilling, not fulfilling yourself. And so there's really a drive to, you know, you have that little, that little feeling and you're gay. My, my, my boys share with these, me with these, these uh, memes and things off the internet all the time. There's one uh, little clip of uh, two fellows that are walking side by side and one says, you know that, that what that happens, you're walking next to somebody and your hand accidentally brushes the next guy's hand and you think, oh, that's nothing, it's just kind of weird. No, you're gay. Anyway, that, that was, that was the, 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 the one-liner for, the, for this joke. But what they're saying there is actually what this is saying, is that this, this, this minor kind of contact, this minor feeling even, this is gay. And so they're, they're trying to bring it all together and Mark Yarhouse, uh, who, who's done a lot of work in this area, and actually was one of our authors for last uh, spring's uh, focus, uh, is very clear how we can separate this stuff out. And so it's very, very important to recognize there's this, uh, uh, layers here that's going on. There's a sexual attraction layer, there's a sexual behavior layer, there's a whole lifestyle layer, and those are actually separate things. One can have sexual attraction and not necessarily act on it in behavior. One could have acted on some sexual attraction in behavior, but not necessarily live a, li a gay lifestyle. These, these are gradations. And what the culture is trying to do is say, no, no, it's all, it's all one. It's all one. And so if you have that feeling, you're gay. And, and it's important to recognize that as we talk to people, that no, no, it's much more complex than that. And I, I know about sexual attraction. I know about that stuff. Not same-sex attraction, maybe, but I, I, I know what it's like to have sexual attractions, and I do not act on it. She's right there. She's, she's watching me. <laughs> <laughs> Honey. <laughs> but uh, so, but we, we have to be able to, to be able to understand that and, and, and recognize the differences and, and recognize that just because one has an attraction doesn't mean it has to necessarily lead to behavior and doesn't necessarily have to lead to being, being a player or some other lifestyle within the heterosexual community, for example. And so uh, we, ha we can respond winsomely then, or at least ourselves to know uh, clearly in our own minds that sexuality doesn't define us. My sexuality doesn't define me. It's part of who I am for sure, but it's not my definition of who I am. Uh, the sexual attraction doesn't need to lead to the unorientation or lifestyle, and the identity then, my identity finally has to be uh, grounded in Christ. If, if, I'm, if, my, if my I am is not part of the great I am, then I'm, I'm lost. We're all lost, and so that I have to know that myself. And how I communicate that to my patients will depend on the the uh, relationship and, and and the moment. But the uh, the key issues there for us in, in terms of identity are our acceptance, our security, our significance. And we have to know this for ourselves as practitioners, because we can get lost in this stuff too. We get into medicine, for example, and we start thinking that our acceptance is. My, my colleagues accepting me, and so I'll have to do more work and, and be a yes man and just keep working, working, working this black hole of burnout. My security is my, how much money I can get. And if I see more patients, I'll get more money, and I can go to Florida and get a house and get a big car and get a heart attack. And my significance <laughs> is my CV and how thick my CV is. And I, the thicker I can get that thing, pad it up with all this kind of fluff, then I'm significant. I get all these letters like I've got, then you're significant. And this is, this is, uh, this is uh, an error. So we have to also recognize 
where our own identity comes from. So where we are accepted because we're children of God. We're secure because nothing can separate from, from, from us from his love. We're significant. We're salt and light. We learned about that. And this week, it's a wonderful title for our uh, conference. And there's um, how we do this is going to depend on, on the, uh, the, the scenario. But Thomas was saying that he does a lot of listening. And, and that's, that's what Mark uh, uh, Yarhouse talks about, too, is listening. So when we're talking to these people, we're doing less talking and more listening. And, and uh, there's a resource list. On, on, there's a handout. The second Porsche page of that handout is a resource list. Uh, the, the book that Thomas uh, uh, mentioned is on the top of that list. Mark Yarhouse's books are in that list, as well as um, uh, others. And Rosario Butterfield, for example, one of my favorites, A Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. Uh, tremendous, unbelievable story, tear-jerking story, remarkable story of someone coming to faith from a lesbian uh, lifestyle into, into uh, a real leader in this whole area uh, for the Christian community. So again, we're making Jesus the issue, not sexuality. And God is, is, is the goal is holiness, not heter uh, homosexu or heterosexuality. 